Welcome. This is the February edition of the Society for One Place Studies monthly hangout. And this month we're going to be discussing, the topic was learn and do. And so we decided that we'd have a little fun with it today. And you'll notice that there's a number of people in the panel. We have room for a few more. If you join us, you know, feel free to join us. Just when you first come in, if you could mute your microphone so we don't have, you know, the sound in the background. And then you can join in and get started. Some of you are going to be watching either in the community or the YouTube channel and that's fine too. If you know the answers to the questions, feel free to join in. What I'm going to do first, um, I'll introduce myself first, uh, Tessa Keo, and I am with the Society for One Place Studies. I am the newsletter editor and the place that I'm studying is Plate Cove East in Newfoundland and that is where my grandfather was originally from. Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Alex from Auckland, New Zealand. Um, I'm also on the committee of the Society for One Place Studies. My One Place Study is for Wing in Buckinghamshire in England, um, and I've been working on that for almost a decade now. So. Okay, great. All right, Jill, it's your turn. Hi, it's Jill from uh, Oz, who are also known as Jenny Oz. I'm a very new member of the society. I think I'm member number 95. And my arm was regally twisted by your chairman, Kirsty, on uh, the recent uh, Unlock the Past cruise. So I'm just here to see what it's all about. Great. All right. And next up is John Laws. Hi. <coughs> yeah, I'm John Laws. Um, I'm. Uh, researching a place called Cold Christmas. Um, my father had a farm there some years ago. Uh, Swangles Farm dates from 1378, supposedly. Okay, that's going to be a lot of research that you have. <laughs> All right, Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Gatcher. I'm the secretary for the society. I've been um, researching my partner one one place study for almost well, just over two decades. Um, so I've got quite a lot of data. It's just about um, getting it all structured. And I also have another study that's a road and a further study that's in Sicily. All right. And so we would refer to Julie as an overachiever. <laughs> and Kim is next know? up. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kim Vatikino. Um I live in uh, Taunton, Somerset, although you may detect I wasn't born there. Uh, I'm studying a little place in Devon called Branton Clovelly that my grandmother's family originated in. Uh, they left there in the 1500s and uh, my family's been in the States for the past 350 years and now I find that I've raised my sons uh, one hour from Branton Clovelly, Devon. I can't quite figure it out. So <laughs> I've been doing my study for about a year. Okay, great. And finally we have Margaret. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, great. Brilliant. Okay. Um, I'm Maggie Gaffney. I haven't joined the society yet. Um, I've just uh, done a, a three week, it's a three or four week course um, online about um, doing a, a one place study. And so I'm looking at a, a townland in County Mayo, Derry Craft. Uh, that my Burke family, they moved from there around the time of the famine and immigrated to Scotland before then moving to New Zealand. So I'm kind of interested in dairy craft and, and in a, like within the 19th century. So starting off fairly small, um, but I haven't registered yet, and uh, I'm just sort of gathering, gathering skills and knowledge at the moment and uh, see where I go. Okay, great. Thanks for joining us. All right, then I think what we're going to do is we're going to play Jeopardy, and I'm the one who knows all the questions and answers, and so I'll be controlling the board. I'll be your Alex Trebek, I guess. And we have Jill, John, and Maggie who are new to either the organization or the idea of working with these one, name, one place studies. Oops. Um, and then we also have Alex and Julie and Kim. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pair you up, okay? And I'm going to separate the people from down under. So I think what I might do is put Kim and Maggie together. I'm going to put Julie and John, um, well, I can't do that. I'm going to put Julie and Jill together. And I'm going to put Alex and John together because I had to separate New Zealand and Australia. So uh, 
what we're going to do is we're going to play the game and either one of you can answer and you know I don't have buzzers or anything like that but this way we'll be able to uh, just learn a little bit more about how you'd go about working on a one place study so if this works I'm going to share the screen and we'll go it's going to take me a minute Okay. All right. Always the best laid plans. But right there. Okay. So hopefully, and I have to blue box it. I've done everything right. You see a screen that just has brown and black on it right now. So we're going to get started. <laughs> so this is One Place Studies, the Jeopardy edition. And it's a little twist here because you're going to see the questions instead of seeing the answers. So I'm going to let um, Alex. Oh can you see it? <laughs> yep. All right, you can all see it. So we're going to start out with Maggie first. So you can choose any question you want and any value. Uh, okay, uh, starting out for 10. All right. So what's a one-place study? Uh, it's a study on a particular place, a uh, geographical place, over an extended period of time. All right. You've got it right. A study of a definable geographical area examining the people and the place and most particularly the relationship between the two. So team one with Maggie already has 10 points. Hopefully this takes us back and you get a go again. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> How does this game work? Um, Okay, uh, social media for 20. All right. What's the society's website URL? Uh, www.one-place.org. One or one, yeah. Oh, can I help her answer that? Oh, yes. oh. I gave the answer too soon. See, I have too many screens going on here. Okay. Um, you could, I'm assuming that our webmaster Kim would know the URL, so we'll go ahead and give you that one. <laughs> All right. So we go back. But I would have been embarrassed if I got it wrong. <laughs> okay. Maggie gets to go again. Oh, gee. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't want to. <laughs> Do you want to pass it off? Well, since we're just playing, you can always go ahead and pass it off. Would you not? Maybe I'll just hand it over to Kim. Oh, thank um, you. you have to hand it over to um, a non-affiliated individual. <laughs> okay. I'm going to hand it over to Jill. <laughs> All right, Jill. Um, oh, give us... Research for 10, please. You're welcome. <laughs> sure. All right. What types of records will provide birth, marriage, and death information for your place? Well, I haven't got a place. Well, if you <laughs> so did have a place. <laughs> All right. Um, well, <laughs> it, am I talking about Australia? Here's it. I'm one of these you can, people. You can pick any for place, my place that you want. Okay, my place would be Galston, New South Wales, Australia, and so therefore the records of the uh, registry, uh, the New South Wales Department of Attorney and Justice will provide birth, death and uh, marriage records. Um, for earlier times, there are the um, some church records available in Australia, but it's not totally um, not, not total coverage okay so, yeah the register yeah 
All right. So the answer that I gave was a little bit more general, which is civil registration okay. or vital but, statistics, but you were very okay. specific. And this is useful to know because I would ask the question for someone who lives in the UK, and I don't know if that's your partner um, on the game, but is it civil registration? Is that what it's called in the UK? Um, it's the, it's the, pay the parish records and the okay. with the GRO indexes. So, yeah. Okay, so that would be good to know. What we would call it in the United States would be um, vital records and they would be with the county a lot of times as well as the state, but they're, they are not done on a national level, so that's interesting to know. Okay. All right, so Jill, you get to go again. Uh, let's go technology for 10. Okay. Where would you look online to find out about One Place Studies? Oh, I would look at uh, One Place Studies, the organisation, are we talking about? That could be One Place, yes. Okay, so I'll look at the, uh, I can do a Google search, a well-structured Google search. I can look at the website, the Society for One Place Studies. Okay. Um, Oh, yeah, that's it. All right. Um, and these are any of the possible answers. Yeah. You could do a Wikipedia um, search. You know, you could just look up the phrase. You could look up the Society for One Place Studies. There's also a register of One Place Studies. Uh, you could look up um, Janet Few, who's one of our members. She has a number of posts and then, you know, any kinds of blogs and websites. But a search engine search, which is what a Jill mentioned, um, would structured. bring up. Yeah, a well-structured one. Even a, a poorly structured one will bring up, if you ask for one place studies, will bring up most of them. Okay. So, Jill, you've okay. done two so far, so why don't we go ahead and pass it off to John and his partner. So, John, which one do you want to take? Is somebody going to go beyond the ten pointers? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, oh, starting out for 50. Ooh, okay, I'm impressed. Go for broke. All right, what's the best way to approach a one-place study? And you can get help. <laughs> uh -huh. I don't know. Alex, do you want no to work one with best them? way to approach <laughs> my study. Okay, there's not... There's the not best way would depend on your way. place. Okay. And if you were going to give somebody advice for doing it, what kinds of things would you encourage them to do to approach it? Uh, probably decide which aspects of the family or local history interests you most and develop something from that, to be honest. Okay. Let's see what I came up with. <laughs> okay. I said um, to get a sense of the size of your study, to break it down into manageable tasks, to either start with a record set or a time period, pick something that you are interested in working with. And if I think if you kind of look at it from those three aspects of it or approaches, you won't get overwhelmed. It won't seem like an all-encompassing tax or, you know, something that you can't handle. You know, mm. kind of you know, play around with it and do what interests you. So I'm going to yeah, go ahead. Certainly keeping that scope narrow. Good Pardon idea. me? Yeah, yeah. Keeping, so John, keeping that scope narrow when you first start out. It's good. Okay. So, John, you get to go again and you get the 50 points since you had help from your uh, <laughs> huh. so your partner. So what's, what's yeah, the next well, one? I'm Alex. Um, I think Alex answered it right and let her do, make the choice. Mm -hmm. Go to it, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go technology for 50. <laughs> technology for 50. I, I love these people who are taking checks. What's the most important skill or characteristic of a one-place researcher? Ooh, I would, I would say persistence. <laughs> yeah, dedication. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> I said a willingness to conduct a serious, thoughtful, and sound research project, knowing that having an open mind, a love of history and people, and an understanding of research techniques trumps technology every time. So I think that 
all does come in into dedication, persistence, uh, you know, just willing to work on, on that study and keeping an open mind about what you're going to find. So, all right. I have to tell you that uh, the other two teams are going to have to go for broke now that it's another person's <laughs> turn since they've already got 100 points compared to your 20. <laughs> so, Maggie, do you want to go again? Um, okay. And Maggie and Kim uh, can go together. <laughs> social media for 50. All right. <laughs> what types of projects could you include? on your blog or website to encourage others to learn more or to join in your one place study. And Kim, you can join in here. <laughs> They're very quiet. You um, It's projects that um, can be applied to all the different types of places that um, people study, for, for example, are uh, projects that um, that others can contribute different kinds of knowledge to. Any kind of project that you'd put on your one place blog or website that might get somebody who's from your place or interested in your place um, willing to work with you or willing to learn more about it. Do you have any particular projects you'd do? Go ahead Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, oh, didn't you two take that class? <laughs> Do you want me to help you out here? We did. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to oh, well. show. Oh, go go ahead. Oh, hang on. <laughs> I'm going to give you one simple one. You would put census well, you information could do, well, on. Okay. Oh, okay. So right. give me some other yeah. projects. <laughs> um, well, you could look at all. <laughs> you could do census. You could um, do do um, you know parish records. You could do a project on uh, directories or gazetteers. You could do a series of maps to show Okay, I'm getting a little now. Feedback. All okay. sorts of things. Okay, I'm going to show you the answer for this and tell everyone that this comes from Janet Few's um, recently published book yeah, on yeah. One Place Studies. <laughs> um, and she has a number of projects in that book. I just, I found it an amazing book uh, to take a look at and to really give me some ideas. Now, one thing I'd say off the top of my head is you might want to work on a World War I remembrance project. Um, and that's you know, something that we're working on here uh, with the society, but there are a number of different projects that you could do, study particular aspects of your place, whether that's the churches or the schools or um, the famous families or crime and punishment. Um, there was some very interesting stuff on historical statistics, you know, the ages people married at or if people moved in or out, um, how significant events affected your place. Perhaps there was a big flood or um, some, um, some buildings that went in. Um, reconstructing families is something some people work on as a project. But as you can see from this um, list here that I'm showing there, and this is only a small snippet of the projects uh, that Janet Few mentions in her book, but there are a lot of really interesting ways you can approach your one place study. Um, and I'm hoping that, that these examples that you're seeing on the screen show you that you could pick something as small as working through a census depending on your population to something as entertaining as following the, you know, people who were elected mayors or, you know, city council or whatever is involved there. So there's a lot of different ways to approach it. All right, Maggie, I don't know if you want to or not, but you get to go again. <laughs> is Maggie still there? Okay. We'll pass it. <laughs> oh, you'll pass it. Okay. Should yeah. we just go through the rest of these questions? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good, Tess. <laughs> okay. All right. Then I'll just take you through the ones that we didn't answer. All right. In starting out for 20 points, and you can just jump in if you know the answer and you want to share it, what's the first thing you should check once you have a place in mind? <laughs> 
make sure no one else is doing it. All right. Excellent, Jill. You get points. <laughs> and that's, you know, whether somebody else is already studying the place. Because one of the things you want to think about is if they're already studying it, you either are going to want to approach it from another aspect or perhaps you're going to want to work with them. Um, and that's, that's one way to, you know, keep the same place but do it um, with somebody else. All right, starting out for 30 is once you've decided upon a place, what's the first thing you should decide upon? You've chosen your place, perhaps it's Plate Cove East. What's the first thing you should check out or decide upon? Anyone? Uh, ooh, how about exactly what your boundaries might uh, be? Boom, you got it. <laughs> Excellent, Alex. Yeah, time scale. So you're getting points. Um, the boundaries. You want to make sure that you've determined for whatever your place is, you know, what your boundaries are so that you know when you start collecting records or working with anything that they fit within the boundaries that you established for your study. You also want to make sure maybe what it connects up with, you know, if there's another study and get in touch with those people. So good job, Alex. Okay. And the last one we have in that group is starting out for 40, which is what factors should you consider when deciding upon a place to study? And maybe we could ask Jill or Meg, well, and Maggie, since they um, are kind of thinking about it but not quite there yet. Well, uh, how onerous it's going to be and what focus you're going to take. Um, that's what I've been thinking about, but I don't know whether that's right or not. Oh, there's no right or wrong answers here. All right, the first oh, one I would okay. say is affinity. Mm -hmm. You know, you really, if you're going to mm -hmm. work on something like this, you have to have an interest in the place. I, I would spend a little time saying, you know, is this something you really, a place that you really want to work with as opposed to just kind of grabbing it. Accessibility both online and offline, are you going to be able to get to that place or do you know someone who can help you out who is in that place? Because if you live, as Alex and I do, many, many miles or kilometers from where our study is, it's quite helpful if you either travel back there or if you have friends or relatives who can do things for you like look up some records or um, interview people or what have you. It's, it's quite nice to be accessible. The ability to register the study, um, as I mentioned before, if, if the study's already registered, you could work with whoever registered it. Um, otherwise, try and bring something new to another version of that study. And then, as Jill said, the amount of research. You know, do you have the time and the ability to gather that data, perform the analysis, and publish it? And so that might help you determine um, how large the place is because you might, you know, nobody wants to do New York City or San Francisco or London. You're going to need to really be able to focus. So, excellent answer, Jill. Okay, now we answered um, research. Let's take a look at research for 20, which is where would you look for population data for your place? And this could be any place anywhere in the world. Population data. Anyone? You could look at uh, HISPOP's a really good one in uh, for here. Mhm. Mm and I would say that in the United States, oh. the Department of Census um, goes ahead and and keeps track of all the statistical analysis of the censuses. Anyone else? And, hello. <laughs> and and we yes? look at the bureau for the the National Bureau for Census and Statistics. Okay. And that is in Australia? Yep. Sorry. Okay. Great. No. <laughs> the accents are very close with New Zealand and Australia. Okay. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Oh, I closed that one out without the answer, but that's what they were. Okay. Research for 30 is where would you look for property or land information for your place? Oh, there's loads of it. Um, <laughs> My All favorite. right, let's hear some. Yeah. My favorite <laughs> is the uh, 1845 ties map here. Um, and okay. uh, we've got a 1910 survey and a 1940 farm survey. I'm so impressed. But I'm also picking up a lot of um, 
information on properties or at least you know where people live from things like uh, voter lists. Uh, I think I just had never looked for that kind of stuff when I was studying surnames and families and I'm just amazed at how much information is out there. The other place I really like, just love, is newspapers because they're just full of sales of uh, properties and they give brilliant mm -hmm. descriptions. So. I'm, I, I'm really impressed with how much information is out there on properties and land. That's great. All right. I'm going to show you what I had up and then everybody go ahead oh, and Can I pipe up for in. Australia? Sure. Oh, That'd sorry. be great. Um, there is a, a book for Australia written by Carol Riley um, and I think it's called Land Records in Australia. Um, so that's a, a source that's not an online source but um, it organised by state in Australia, so for New South Wales it's uh, Lands and Property Information, a government department. Great. Um, I know that I had looked up, um, we have land tax assessments and we have um, rental records as well as um, you know the countywide records when you buy and sell property or rent it out. Um, in the United States there were a lot of federal land grants and those were done through the Homestead Act or for bounties if you served in the military and a lot of that information is held by the National Archives and, and is also online through um, I think it's called BLM. Um, there's also fire insurance company maps. I know in the United States they're Sanborn. I don't know what they are in other countries, but in order to give the insurance policies out on properties, they went and looked at um, and kind of uh, plotted the various towns and, and determined what the buildings were made out of and um, you know how many rooms and the rest of that kind of information. So a lot of times those are very interesting maps to look at. And they're bound and in books that are usually held at local as well as state libraries. They're also held at the um, uh, Library of Congress. Um, and I know that ordinance surveys list out a lot of, um, at least the, the land. They don't list property information, but a lot of times they um, do very good maps on a very, um, I would say, small area scope of um, places. And that might be something else to take a look at. Anything else? Well, uh, we have... Uh land registry in the UK which applies to all property okay to the, you know um, if you want to check the title deeds of anything including this humble flat in Scotland <laughs> <laughs> great all right thanks John anybody else have anything I know when I was up in Newfoundland um, all of the land supposedly uh, came from either squatting on the land or um, crown grants um, which was interesting to me and so you went back and you looked at their registry office for that type of information. Alright on research for 40 how would you determine the boundaries of and the buildings or facilities included in your one place study? Very quiet. Well, I guess that comes down to the registry again, and and maps of the area. Oh, very um, good, John. <laughs> um, historical maps are a real good thing to use, as well as um, you can take a look at <coughs> images, and you can get those from postcards or directories. I know a lot of the local directories always had information, or kind of had um, somebody had walked the the town and had kind of uh, drawn everything up. Photographs, community histories might list it, as well as if you go out and actually map your community yourself, kind of walk it and you know draw up what the um, areas are. Alright, now we're going to go back to technology and this is technology for 20. Are there any online courses you can take to learn more about various aspects of one place studies? So why don't Kim and Maggie take this one? <laughs> we would recommend <laughs> the Pharaoh's one place studies course. We All would. Right. Okay, you both recently took that. What's involved in the course? It was really. Um, it was, well, go it ahead, was, Maggie. It, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, for me, being a beginner, um, it was really useful to see, you know, to, to, to how to pick a place, how to define it. I mean, I had three different places that I was thinking of, and um, and it also sort of like highlight the resources that you can use and how it's different from, 
you know, looking at just one family and that look, looking at, at a particular place. And it could be a, a street, it could be a parish, um, it could be just one building. There's lots of different um, studies. So it was that was kind of interesting and, and, yeah, just a different way of looking at things. And it's made me... Um, you know, change the way I, I, I then research my own family because I'm, I'm interested more about the places as well now. But it was it was an online course, and so you did different. You focused on different um, areas each week. I think it was three weeks, wasn't it, Kim? Three or four weeks. Um, and you had uh, uh, some assignments to do, which you know you could do or not. But and and then a weekly chat, an online chat. So it was a, a gentle introduction to one place studies without being too overwhelming. So I would recommend that one. That was good. All right. And I uh, look. I have been about a year into my study. Um, I really got a lot out of it too. I, it just gave me a chance to really think about where where I was headed with my study, what I wanted to focus on. I went back and we did a lot of work, Maggie, didn't we, on um, thinking about you know useful sources and, and, it, and I went back and re looked at like the local repositories and catalogs and. Last year, I think I was so absorbed with census records and parish registers and some of the real basics, and now it just uh, I just noticed a lot more things, you know, mm -hmm. a year on that would be of interest and, and, and really be helpful. The other thing we did was we spent a, a quite a bit of time thinking about how we would share and publicize our studies and mm -hmm. what our objectives were with that, and we went and looked at a number of websites, including yours, Alex. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and it just was a lot of food for thought and, and then I think we all kind of got some time to just say hey what what were our priorities what what did we want to kind of do next and, and focus on so I think it could be helpful for people at various points in their studies okay and who taught that course Celia Heritage okay all right excellent yay I even had the right answer there here. There are other ones too, though. Um, <laughs> That's what we're doing. We're taking a look at the rest of the answer. Yeah. So Pharos was the first one that I mentioned. I really liked when I saw the listing for it. I liked the fact that it was a relatively short course because I think sometimes the courses get overwhelming. Um, but it looked like it had a lot of um, meat in it, so to speak. I also know that the national. Oh, I knew I was going to do this. The is it the. NGIS, I believe, is yeah. what it's called. The Institute. Institute, yeah, something like Thank that. Thank you. Um, and I believe they're out of Canada. Um, they oh. offer a course in One Place Studies as well. And then there's online courses, um, webinars, hangouts. You know, what we're doing today is talking about One Place Studies. Um, but there are definitely. Um, you know, check out with your local history organization. A lot of times, NARA has stuff in the United States. Friends of NARA for the Southeast region will talk about um, their focus was really on the different record sets that are um, housed at NARA. And if you use something like that in your one place study, that would be very useful. So there's a lot of a lot of courses or online discussions that you could take advantage of to learn more about your place. You might need to find out more. More about censuses, you know, go on to Ancestry. They have um, Krista Cowan talks about how to do research on censuses and then apply it to your one place study. So it's not always that you're going to find the name one place study in the course or the discussion, but you might be looking at record sets or time frames. Certainly, um, there's a history. Um, group on Google uh, Plus as a community, and they discuss certain uh, important aspects of history, and you might want to apply it if, if that would be of any interest to your study. So, anybody else have anything else on this? I just wanted to say on your last point, Tessa, um, kind of a lot of the reflection that I got a chance to do in Celia's course, uh, when I came out of it, I, uh, I really felt that what I really wanted to do was learn a lot more about local history. And so now uh, I think that that her course really encouraged me uh, to give a lot more thought to that. And so now I'm looking at um, local history courses in particular. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that, and I don't know what your place is like, because this certainly wouldn't apply for Plate Cove East necessarily. But there might be something, you know, at Memorial University, which is in St. John's, that's talking about local places. And in fact, what I'd point out here is that they have a wonderful 
um, online resource about the entire history of Newfoundland. And then what you'd need to do is put your own place or your own region in there. And so you might look up a national university or a regional university and they might have a treasure trove of information that someone has left them um, because they've turned their papers over to that university or that archives. And so there's a lot of different ways of finding information about your place that way. All right, the next question we have is Technology for 30. What software programs or applications might be helpful to use in conducting a one-place study? Spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I agree with you. Uh, wikis. <clears throat> oh, excellent. I think a wiki would be a great um, application. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I know that well, as long I, as you get the structure right. Yeah, to start with. And that's, that's a tough one. Um, yep. I know that I use a genealogical database program just because I reconstruct the families that are in mm -hmm. Plate Cove. And so I've put them into the program. So that's another thing. Um, anything yep. else? Well, I think, you, I think you need yeah a range of things. You need something to work in and then something to publish. And whether that's one and the same tool or in a couple of different tools. Sure. Um, I'm going to put up a few and yeah. we can talk mm -hmm. about any of them or if, or if people, you know, obviously camera is what I meant was a program that you could actually, you know, send your photos. Um, a genealogy database program. I think a note taking program is pretty helpful. Um, I've just listed two, but there's a number of them. Google Keep and, you know, some people just use their word processing program to grab information. But certainly if you're um, doing research online and you want to grab a website or an article or something like that, that's kind of a nice thing to be able to have your notes in. I think a word processing program, whatever you use, is very useful because I, while there are a lot of great programs out there to do individual little things, a word processing program is really helpful to, you know, bring it all together, especially if you're writing, um, I would say. Um, anything else that anyone can think of? All I'll right. Grab, I'll grab I'll, everything into Evernote. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Well, and I think that if you get into uh, family reconstitution, I think there's still a place for family tree software. I just uh, think that oh, it's, absolutely. Not, it's not great for, I think, collecting up a lot of information about places. Exactly. Uh, but, uh, but I'd still use it um, uh, for yeah. the family trees. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I really think the wiki is, is a great um, application. Okay. I am definitely going to have to add people and places. Yeah. I'm going to have to add that to the answer for future reference. <laughs> Thanks, Jill. I appreciate that. I think that could be especially useful where you're using, uh, where the place that you're researching is tiny. Um, because with a limited catchment of people, you'll find that an awful lot of the individuals were intermarried within a community. Oh, that's true. I will say that that's definitely true for my area. All right, we're going to move on to technology for 40. What's one of the easiest ways to learn about one place studies? And I think Maggie may have answered this before. Maggie and Kim did. So I'm going to go directly there to the answer. I think it's really helpful to read through websites. Um, and certainly to check out websites that other one place studiers have put online. I find that especially useful to see maybe how they've published their study or their updates. Um, it gives you a lot of food for thought. Uh, it's also really helpful to read their blogs, especially the um, one place researchers who are kind of giving you a monthly or quarterly update on what they're doing or what data set they've moved on to or if they're working on a special project. A lot of times they do a really good job of telling you about their methodology and right here I would mention Alex <laughs> um, because one of the first things that I looked at when I looked up one place studies was the wing um, 
blog that she did um, and and she kind of listed out things that she was working on and I felt what was really helpful was when she would say things like this didn't go as I planned it or you know I went back and added back. something to it <laughs> um, you know make sure you take pictures or give yourself enough time I mean a lot of those things um, I think you were also the person who mentioned about when you take photographs make sure that you have a big photograph of the area you know and then and then focus on the smaller things so that you have some some frame of reference um, and so I think that we learn so much from the other people who are also doing their work and it, it gives you a, a real sense of camaraderie I think as well um, because some people make it look so easy that it that it can almost be a little depressing but um, you know they, they might try a different blog maybe they started out in blogger and now they're using WordPress or perhaps they've put a, a website on in Weebly you know they're trying new things and you can kind of see what works for you um, and and feel free I would say to look at their structure and you know if they have a list of 10 data sets that they've worked on you know maybe not every one of those data sets applies to you but maybe three or four do and they would be things you hadn't thought of um, so I think that that's useful you mentioning um, Alex's site made me think about too when I was first um, thinking about doing a one place study and the article is now on our Society of One Place Studies website but it, Alex's article on uh, choosing a place Alex I've told you this before um, really got, <laughs> got me thinking and, and actually I uh, kind of looking at the list of things of, of you know the type of place you might choose and or, or why I think really actually helped me uh, not only to decide that I had the right, I was thinking about the right place, but actually encouraged me to go ahead and get going. So I agree, going out there and looking at what's out there and, and what other folks have to say can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. I think that's really helpful. Great. All right, we're going to move on to social media for 20. What types of social media should you engage in to assist in spreading the word about your one place study? Google Hangouts, maybe? Yeah, Google Hangouts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that answer. <laughs> I think I what, would, Go ahead. I, uh, sorry. Jill, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think you need to be consistent. Have a, have a social media policy for your one place study. So not take the scattergun approach, but um, choose a couple of tools and use them so people will know where um, you're going to write about your um, one place study. So select Google Plus and Twitter or select Facebook and Google Plus, whatever, but just select a couple of tools and focus on using them so people know where to look. I think that's a really good idea and I would say I love Google Plus and I was on Google Plus from day two I think um, and I just much prefer it. I do not enjoy Facebook. Never have anyone who knows me knows that I go on once a month and I kind of dread it each time. However, when I was going up to Play Cove, my niece mentioned that I should look on Facebook to see if there was anybody from Plate Cove on there and what I found out was there's a Plate Cove community. They have their own page. People who've lived there, people who've moved from there, you know, whatever. They share photos, um, they have conversations and so I was able to introduce myself there and then I had some people to meet up with and so I never would have found any of those people if I wouldn't have, you know, kind of swallowed and, and thought, fine, I'll go on Facebook and so I use that for interacting with people who've now become friends or people that I need to, you know, I want to get information from or share things with. I'll put my information into my blog or the website that hasn't gone public yet. But I will, I would agree with you. I think you at least have to go on and see what's at these various places. Um, but then I think you need to make some decisions on what you're doing and kind of layer it, but not be on everything or not publish the same thing on every site. I think that's a really good idea. All right, we have social media for 30. What types of items should you include in your social media presence? So if you've decided to do a blog or a website or you're going on Twitter or anything else, what kinds of things would you put out there about your one place study? Well, 
I'm not getting well, the response. Oh, Go well. ahead. The, uh, put out <laughs> things where you're like I I put on my blog. Um, I, I said to folks, it's it's a little hard to uh, recon reconstruct family trees in my community because of migration and people coming and going. And so I put on my blog, you know, if anybody, you know, is researching some of these families and and is willing to share. Uh, and and I've gotten some really good uh, contacts on that. So I think things where you think a collective effort or, you know, that, that it might be much better engaging with others um, to do some aspects of the research would be the sorts of things that I'd like to put on social media. Okay, great. Uh, I'd like to include photographs because I think they often draw people in. Some people are visual learners, some people aren't. Um, so <clears throat> as well as text type items, um, include images. Mm -hmm. that uh, will resonate with people. Okay. You know, here's, here's this old picture of, you know, of the church in whenever mm -hmm. and, and try and get people to, to respond, yeah. Okay. Um, a couple of things that I'd tell you right from the get-go uh -huh. is to, you know, describe the place, so, you know, because there might be two, uh -huh. um, there there aren't two plate coves, but there could be, so you want to make sure that, you know, you know what country it's in, but make sure that it's clear to everyone else the place you're talking about. Always include your contact information. I have this happen a couple times where people will send me a, mm -hmm. a, a response back on a blog, but they don't put any way to get a hold of them. They're like, oh, my mother others from that place. I'd love to talk to you about it. But they don't tell you who they are. They've come in under anonymous or something. So definitely your contact information and theirs. Um, I think it's always important to have a call to action. You know, say, I want to find out about these families. Or, you know, do you have any photographs? Or I have this to share. What do you have? Or, you know, get them to, to want to be involved in it with something, you know, really, it, it doesn't have to be big. Um, it can be, I can identify these five people in this photograph. Does anyone know who they are? You know, that kind of thing, but to get them involved. And then it's also important to regularly update. I don't think you have to be blogging every day, um, but I do think that if you say you're doing a study and, and you want people to keep coming back to find out what's going on, you know, at least quarterly, kind of fill them in on what's going on so that they have a reason to come back to your um, social media. All right, um, social media for 40. Who's the society's social networking coordinator and why is she one of the best people to know about if you're conducting a one-place study? <laughs> Ooh, cool. It seems unfair for us society members to pop in and tell you who that might be. Um, but that is, Jan um, <laughs> that is <laughs> Janet Few. <laughs> <laughs> You're <And> right. <laughs> because she's a recently published author on the topic of one place studies. <laughs> she is. She's also our vice chair and I have to tell you I was given an opportunity to take a look at her book and I was incredibly impressed. You know at first when you hear something's under 100 pages you're kind of like hmm. Um, there is so much packed in that book and just, just for the bibliographies alone in each chapter, that book is amazing, uh, especially because I'm not from the UK, so it gives me a whole window into other types of records to look at, and since my place is in what's now, you know, has joined Canada, um, but it, it came as a, I think it was an independent some kind of entity of Great Britain before Newfoundland was. Um, but it gives me things to think about and look at or say, oh, maybe they kept a British record about this, you know, at the time. And it wasn't something I'd ever thought about before. Um, she, but the, uh, the thing that I thought was the most amazing was she has various projects that you can work on. And she kind of lays out what the project is and makes a suggestion about it. And I just, I found the book really, really well written and very, very, um, conversationally written, you know, you could easily get through the book, um, but you you find that you're highlighting or making a lot of notes in it, and so I think it would be excellent for people to use to kind of check it against what they're doing and to get some more ideas. So and Tess, I'd, I'd add to that, I, um, I saw Janet um, uh, present last weekend at Who Do You Think You Are, and I, oh. I bought the book then, and I didn't even, 
I had finished the book before I ever got home from London. Um, it was really interesting. It's not a huge book. It's just full of mm -hmm. great ideas. The projects were great, but I think the other thing I really appreciated was it, it just gave me more confidence in kind of the the sorts of things I'm thinking about in my one place study and and uh, kind of the direction that I'm going. You know, I just felt like, oh, okay, you know, um, it kind of fit in with the sorts of things she was talking about. Uh, so I really, I found it helpful. Right. There were a couple times where I was nodding my head going, oh, good, I've done that, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Oh, I know what I'm doing. Um, and then some other things that she suggested that I thought, oh, wow, I never, th I had never thought about looking at the court records, like for crime and that kind of thing. And I thought, oh, that's kind of an interesting aspect. Um, I don't know if I want to find out that my people committed a lot of crimes. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so let's go for, we just have four more questions. Okay, what's the name of the society's newsletter and how often is it published? I can't answer this question since I know the answer. <laughs> I can answer this question. Okay, go ahead. You're working it's with Destinations, Maggie. Destinations and Tessa is the <laughs> newsletter editor and it's published quarterly. <laughs> it is published quarterly and it should be coming out at the beginning of March. So if you're already a member of the society, you should take a look for it then. But you're right. And I said that it's published four times a year. So the one thing I wanted to point out, I wasn't going to point out that I was the editor, um, but to point out that articles from members are always welcome. So if you're doing a one place study or if you've taken a course in one place studies and you're just thinking about it, um, we would definitely um, be happy to see an article from you and, and publish something in our newsletter. And also if you have any questions, we take questions every quarter as well and try to answer them. One of the really nice things I think in the newsletter is also something that Kim works on. She's our webmaster and so she goes through a resource that's on on the website and basically walks you through it and explains what might be some of the frequently asked questions that she gets so that it, it makes you more comfortable about doing your profile or your in-depth study or that type of thing. So very helpful. All right. Social, not social media or was it? That's wrong. It's Society for 30. <laughs> um, do you have to register a one place study once you join the Society of One Place Studies? Society for One Place Studies, sorry. <laughs> well, if Kirsty told us the right thing on the cruise, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to stop for a minute. We want to hear about this cruise, Jill. Okay, so Kirsty was on it, and she was encouraging everyone to join. Is that the case oh, or what? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's only 10 quid, she's saying. It's only 10 quid. <laughs> And she was, Such a deal. she was bribing us with your little badges. Um, oh, okay. So um, she bribed with badges. I've, That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. You are correct. She you gave do... a great talk. Good. Okay, good. I'm glad. Yeah. You can join the society and learn more about, and this is what I think is really important. The methodology in any kind of specialized um, study I think is really important. And in fact, I joined the Guild of One Name Studies to find out about the methodology because I was applying it to my one place study. You know, I hadn't seen anything about one place study, so I just thought, well, you know, maybe they're similar. I think any kind of organization that, enc that really encourages that kind of scholarship or the methodology is very important um, and then you know take your time you know kind of see what you want to do with it you never have to register a study but it might be something that, that really helps you just increase even your own family history by looking at it from different aspects mm -hmm. so you're right Jill you don't ever have to register a study but we'd love it if you did <laughs> all right and our, I think our last two questions when are the society's monthly hangouts on air? I so <laughs> want to say monthly, monthly. <laughs> and then the last, the last Friday of every month. They're Yay. actually, they're actually the fourth Friday. So oh, interestingly okay. enough, I think one month it worked out that there were five the Fridays. Um, but for yeah, the most, <laughs> you're right. It's it's um it's monthly and it's on the fourth Friday of each month. But I'm Maggie, I think I've been anyway. to every one of them, and I would have answered the same way as you. <laughs> <laughs> and the last question, 
Jeez. Who's the society? I, there's one member who can't answer this. Who's the society member coordinating the World War One Centenary Project at the Society website? That would be Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Alex Coles out of New Zealand with a wing, England one place study and Alex I wanted you to just talk for a few minutes about where you're at with your project and what's been going on in the past month or so. Ah, Okay, I I've had some very interesting developments on my project this week as it happens using one of your favorite techniques Tessa. <laughs> um, I have a list of and I'm going through making sure that I do have all the military records for their service that I can find. Um, I had most of those names previously, but I hadn't actually done a comprehensive, solid um, check through all the records to make sure I had everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually let a current resident of Wing know that that's what I was working on, and she <laughs> turned around and said, "I've actually been transcribing the parish magazines from World War One period." And she's got oh, more names for me. Wonderful. And she'd nearly that finished that great. project, so she has sent <laughs> me some e excerpts from those magazines. And I just started looking at those yesterday, and there's uh, sort of between. 60 to 100 extra names, I think, that I don't currently have, um, which brings me up to the kind of total number of servicemen from wing that I was expecting. So mm -hmm. I'm quite excited about that and also daunted by the amount of extra research I now have in front of me. <laughs> I was going to say, it's great when you hear something like that and somebody has already done some of that work and then you think to yourself, oh, but that gives me a little extra work to do. But that I think it's very important to get people who are there already. Um, another real interesting thing to do I had heard was um, somebody was involving, I think it was Janet, she was involving some of the school children in a project. Mm. Um, and you know, if you can work with whether it's history or social studies or perhaps um, it's their writing class, um, you know, if the kids already live there, they're going to know some of those people there. Um, and that could be a, a real helpful thing as well. Yeah, so. I've heard particularly in the UK, I know I've heard a lot of talk about schools doing World War projects this year. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if that's extending to um, other countries as well, but certainly in England. I think there's a lot of interest there, so there's a lot of potential right. to team up. I have a feeling that it's going to come up later in the United States because yes. the United States wasn't involved in, you know, wasn't involved militarily mm -hmm. in the war until later. But I think this is going to be one of those projects that carries on for, you know, four or five years, which is kind of nice because once I look at the amount of work that's involved in it, I know I can't get it all done in one year. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you. Okay, so. Um, I just wanted to open this up now to anyone who wants to chat about um, what they have, you know, maybe what you have found is, you know, because we were talking about learning and doing. Um, if there's a if there's resources that you've just recently found out about, I know Kim mentioned a few that you're finding especially helpful with your one place study, or maybe there's something that you kind of worked with before but you didn't take you know, really good advantage of and that you're going back to redo and if you could tell us about that now so that the rest of us get it right the first time that would be great. I think my, pro I, I've got a little problem at, at this point. Um, it's uh, in that I think now I'm struggling with how much information there is uh, and um, it, in trying to just kind of kind of keep things contained and focus on things. It's just everywhere I look I'm learning uh, from all kinds of new sources. So, I'm, And there's things just of value in, 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 in everything I pick up, whether it's, a, it's from the record office or whether it's uh, from a local history book or, or magazine or the like. Mm -hmm. It's a little overwhelming right now. I could see like 20 years of work or something easily. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think that's what we all, you know, at first you think, oh, I'll be done with this once I've looked at these five record sets. And then once I looked at Janet's book, I thought, oh, there, there's as many or as few things as you want to do, but you, you yeah. keep thinking of new ways of approaching it. One thing that was really helpful to me was reading about how to do a cemetery walk because so many times we just take pictures and we don't really think about it and it was about a photographer who took pictures at a cemetery for a particular project so it didn't have anything to do with genealogy he was mapping it for a different reason but once I read his information it was just online you know he said be sure you film the entire cemetery first you know just use your cameras film ability and and do a video and then put them all in order he said you know so many people take these pictures and then you know don't they number them differently or they name them differently he said keep track of how you take the photos and do it in order because you'll find people who are all buried in the same area together so you don't want it done alphabetically you want it done by how people are buried so mm -hmm. to speak um, and he talked about making sure you got pictures of the memorials you know take pictures of people who aren't your people you know because sooner or later they might be your people um, but just know who the community members are that were there or maybe why they were all there and so it he even had some tips on you know how to get better pictures and all of that and I could always use those tips because I'm a horrible photographer um, but it was very interesting to me to to make that video first because it, it put things in much better context and I never would have thought of that and you know your comment on community there Tessa I was just thinking today about kind of how, how things have changed in my head since I've started into my one place study. I started into it because it was the, uh, where my grandmother's family originated and although they left there in the 1500s, that was my draw to the place. Now it's like uh, it, the community has taken over. I want to know everything there is to know about the place and that's what's given me the problem on kind of information overload at this point. Mm -hmm. But now it's like I, I'm just anxious to learn about every family and 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 it's not just all about my ancestors by any means anymore. Mm -hmm. um, Janet also had an interesting comment in her book that you know it's all well and good to find out and some people are very interested in this who's famous from your community or you know the important people and she said everyone's important every single person who lived in that community contributed to it and it's important to know the families that were there and then left you know they were only there for a short time maybe why did they come in why did they leave the families who stayed you know who in the family stayed um, I thought it was very interesting when she made the comment that you know everybody's important and I think that's one of the most interesting things in doing a one place study is you know you're focused on a place that maybe no one else is aware of you know or pays attention to except that small local community but you're giving them an opportunity to be you know known and to have their history known and I think that's important and it's not just every person it's like everything because I just started back a couple weeks ago I had, last year I'd done some newspaper extracts and I would kind of picked out the really interesting stories the big ones you know and uh, crime or anything and now I'm back I started back a few weeks ago I want every tidbit I want to know when the cattle markets are I want to know who was clay pigeon shooting I want to know who who went and ran a race and won a prize I want to under, get a feel for what life was like in that community down to the most minute detail and kind of what was the normal everyday life for people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I know when I f first started doing my study, I had to find out uh, all about um, cod fishing and seal, you know, seals and whaling and the rest of it because that's what the what they did. Um, and the more you found out about that, the more you thought to yourself, you know, what a tough life you know people had and how much work was involved in doing something that we might think is so simple fishing you know you have to be able to control the boat and the flakes and the rest of it and it just you really thought to yourself you know we have it so much easier um, but it kind of really made you understand something a little bit more about the people then by knowing what they you know the occupations or trades so anyone else Everybody's gone pretty quiet. <laughs> All right, so what are you going to take away or what are you going to be working on in the next month with your one place study? Alex, do you want to go first? 
I'll be continuing to work through my now enormous list of servicemen <laughs> looking for records. <laughs> so you're really focusing this year on working on the project. Oh, on the Is World War One project, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's right. going to take a lot of time. And although I had identified a few other things I also wanted to work on this year, realistically, I don't know if I'll have time to do mm -hmm. them. And it probably makes m much more sense to really focus on it. I find I do a better job if I'm focused. Um, yeah. So what are you going to be looking at to find out more about those people's names that you've just received? Um, I'll be searching the various record sets available for military records, service records, medal rolls, wills and things. Um, I'll also then be trying to create a profile of each of those servicemen, so looking at the broader family issues, so checking them out in the census and parish registers, things like that, um, and looking at what trade they were involved in prior to the war and then what they did while they were serving because I believe there's likely to be a connection there okay. and what impact having that man out of that community might have had on Wing Ford because okay. those tradesmen just went there. Right. Interesting. All right, <laughs> great. Now, I know that Jill is not doing a study right now, so I want to know, Jill, what are you going to be doing just for regular genealogy life in the next month? <laughs> I'm always trying to organize myself. Um, but on the study and, and what you said okay. about takeaways, um, I've taken away a bit. I'm taking away a better understanding of what a one-place study is. Um, I've taken on some fear about diving in um, because you be highlighted to me how how extensive um, a study can be and and how much work is involved to do it seriously. I so I'm going to think about whether I want to dive in and I'm going to think about how. I would present a study. I know where I'll do, but I've just got to think about my focus and all of those things. So I'm taking away a lot of learning from this. Okay. And one thing I want to point yeah. out is that I believe you are doing a Hangout on a note-taking app. Is that correct? Uh, you can be talking about Evernote? Next week I've got an Evernote Hangout, okay. yes. So I would say anyone who uses Evernote or is thinking about mm -hmm. using Evernote and, you know, there's there's a free version of the app and so definitely, you know, it's something to take a look mm -hmm. at. Um, you might want to attend Jill's Hangout or watch it archived. I know you're on a little early sometimes for some people who are <laughs> in other places, yeah. but you're yeah. on on time for people in Australia, right? <laughs> Yeah, because most Hangouts are at not a very friendly time for Australia, so the Hangouts that I host, I have at Australia friendly time, so other and people I think, can watch I them on YouTube. I think that is a very good idea because I think that a really nice thing about the Hangouts is you can have them at whatever time works best for the person doing the Hangout. I always want to encourage Absolutely. that. And, and you can yeah. always watch the archived version. So sometimes yeah. I'm able to attend and other times I've watched it archived and it works great either way. So, um, all right. Oh, hang on. Can you see that? That's uh, uh, Yes. I see it. It's Genie Oz. Hang out with, with Genie Oz. Genie Oz. G E N I A U S. If you search for that, you'll find our community. Mm hmm. Excellent. Okay. Yep. And the other thing you can do on Google Plus is just type in plus Jill Ball and it will bring up, yep. and you can see her lower third right there, it will bring her up and then if you add her to your circles, you will get all kinds of, um, you'll see her um, posts and they'll be very helpful. <laughs> all right. John, what are you but working can, on? Um, can I just say to Jill, what time is it in Australia? No, it's yeah. uh, 8.09 a.m. 8.09 a.m. And it's 10 past... So we're 11 hours different at the moment, I think. 10, 10 past 9 at night in yep. Scotland. Yeah. All oh, right. So my hangouts are uh, during the day in the UK. Yeah. And one other morning. thing, John, before you go on, one other thing is if you say yes or maybe to a Hangout invitation, Google puts it in your time zone. So you don't have to ask when is yeah, that, sure. you know, here. Mm -hmm. um, so take a look no. at it. I always say yes or maybe and then, you know, for instance, Jill's will show up as 1.30 and depending if I'm already going to be up, I'll, I'll join it or I'll just know that she did have the Hangout and I can always watch it archived. So go ahead and say maybe if you want to check the time zone. So that will work. And John, so what are you working on right now? Well, it, I'm 
primarily at the moment I'm working with my one name study and trying to work on the guys who went to war. Okay. Um, and, and those who went and those who didn't come back. Um, with the one place study, um, I am realizing more and more that I need to do a larger area than just the farm and the hamlet in which it occurred because the, the population is very small. And what do you mean by very small? Very small. Um, well, uh, there's there's four cottages, mm -hmm. one farm, um, and at some time in the last century, there was a volunteer armory, and they built a uh, a building and had a rifle range that went across the valley. Um, but of course, it all came in the parish. Um, the parish was called Thundridge, um, and I think we were very much on the edge of the parish. Okay. Um, so a quick question I have as an American is, what is a hamlet? A hamlet is a village that doesn't have a church. Oh, okay. All if right. you don't have a church, you are not a village. Um, we don't have we don't have a church or a chapel. Um, okay. Um, and I, when it's a chapel, it's a nonconformist. You know, and like Methodists or Baptists or um, Huntingdon's persuasion. Um, whereas if, if Thundridge has a church and attached to Thundridge across the river is Wade's Mill, but that doesn't and have a church either. <laughs> no. so, so you have a, a number of, of small places, and I, I guess. In comparing it, Play Cove East has at most 230, and it started out in it, and it's you know currently has about 70, and you know so it, it's never gotten huge, which works out really well for a, a one place study for me. But I'm thinking if you only have four cottages, it might be, it yeah, would, it would certainly be a smaller still. <laughs> I would guess that now that the Hamlet, which is Cold Christmas. And Timber Hall, that has a population, I guess, of somewhere in a region of forty to fifty people. Mm -hmm. But historically, Timber Hall was a, a Elizabethan manor house, and I don't know of any old properties there. And Swangles Farm, as I say, was a. Uh, um, a 13th century hall house that was extended in Elizabethan times and I lived there as a boy. It's very spooky. <laughs> very well, it, spooky. Sounds like, it sounds like you're going to have to figure out what we talked about at the beginning which is the boundaries and so that might yeah, be something yeah. to, to think about what you're doing. Okay, very interesting. Kim, how about you? What are you going to be focusing on this month? Well, I'm very busy with the World War I study. Uh, my, my place is not as big as Alex's, but her tips have meant that I've found a lot of soldiers and sailors. Um, so lots to do there. Uh, the other thing that I'm really interested in, Maggie will appreciate this, I think. We did quite a bit of work on population and in our One Place Studies course. and. Um, and I'm very interested in that migration, so I'm trying to further my analysis and really, really go a lot more in depth in that. I also recently read a, a really excellent book by Andrew Hind on England's population, and and it gives um, uh, kind of uh, ways from doomsday to the present day of kind of taking your record sources and the information that you probably do have and extrapolating, um, you know, an understanding of the population of your your place through many centuries. So I think those two will keep me very busy um, 
and then just continue photographing other records to come in the future. <laughs> okay, and one thing I want to point out is if you haven't had an opportunity to download um, the items yet um, and you're a member of the Society, definitely take a look at the inspiration sheet and the template for service people, if that's the correct terminology, that Alex put together because um, very useful that inspiration sheet will give you a lot of things that you might not have thought of to think of and the template gets you started if you want to make some changes or or maybe you're working on a different country and it's a little bit different you can always play with it but it's it's so much easier than looking at a blank piece of paper or blank spreadsheet and trying to come up with it so definitely check that out and I know in both the newsletter that's going to be published next week um, there's a link to it but it's also at the society website and now Maggie what are you going to be working on in the coming month well I think I think I'm gonna to have to join the society Oh, good. <laughs> um, I, was, I was a bit concerned. I was a bit concerned that I'd have to register a place straight away. So I think my best bet is really to join and then um, hopefully get some guidance from the the members only section. Um, and be, I'm planning to visit my place in May. So I really want to sort of prep for that and see what other people have already transcribed and got online and see what added value I can. I can give by you know when I'm on the spot, take loads of photographs, um, and so that's the the one place. And then I've got a couple of other courses I'm I'm going to do. I'm going to do one name study course next mm -hmm. starting next month as well, just to throw that in the mix. Okay, great. <laughs> um, one thing I would suggest, and I don't know if it works the same in your local libraries, is in the United States, at most local libraries, and I noticed this in Canada too when I was up in Newfoundland, there is a section um, and it, it almost looks like it's file cabinets or oversized areas and if you ask the librarian they will show you what individuals have given them and it might it's not a book you know it's not something that's published you know and is on the shelves like a number of other things but it is um, I think they call it the vertical file and so it's anytime anyone is given them you know maybe your family had um, you know little family newsletters or maybe somebody turned in letters or you know whatever uh, maybe the church had weekly bulletins that they turn in and so there's all kinds of this I would almost say kind of unusual but fun stuff to go through it's it's like going through an attic but you don't have to have it in your home um, kind of thing so definitely check out the vertical file because I found a lot of real interesting stuff when I was up there and I wouldn't have known to look for it except for getting a tip from someone else all right well I think we've pretty much covered everything you know kind of a potpourri of uh, uh, various things that you could learn and do with a one place study and I appreciate appreciate everyone being good sports about playing Jeopardy today. And I wanted to say, Margaret, uh, Maggie, are you located in the UK or? Um, yes, I am. I am at the moment. I'm, I'm a Kiwi, um, and I'm, but I'm living in, in the UK at the moment. Okay. All right. Great. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone who joined me today. I'm, we, we somehow lost Julie at some point, but I didn't have the screen up, so I didn't see it. Um, and we had some viewers over in the community and at YouTube. And if you didn't get a chance to watch this live and you're watching the recorded version, you know, please go ahead and leave any comments that you have about it after the fact. And if you have questions, um, we'll get back to you on that. And I'd just like to thank everyone who joined me today. And we will see you next month on the fourth Friday of the month um, and we will be putting um, all of the hangout topics um, in both the newsletter as well as um, there's a Genia calendar that's going up about that so that you'll know what the topics are for the future so I'd like to thank everyone for attending and we will see you all next month thank you so much thank you, thank you Tessa